Today's episode of Author Stories is brought to you by Clones, the anthology. In this collection of clone-themed stories, ten of today's top speculative fiction writers explore our morality, our built-in societal restraints, and reflect upon our state of grace. Similar is not necessarily the same. Pick up Clones, the anthology, today for 99 cents. The price goes up tomorrow, so get it while it's at this low, low introductory price. You won't regret it. Clones, the anthology. It's episode 106 of the Author Stories podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for tuning in each week. I really appreciate it. Uh, You can find all the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please click on the link to subscribe to the show and go to iTunes and uh, leave us a comment. It helps other people find us. Before we get into our great interview this week, I'd like to tell you about one of our sponsors, and that's the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. The AIPP uh, is an organization that helps band together uh, freelancers and people that help support uh, the indie author community. And uh, by that, I mean people that do uh, you know, cover design or layout, uh, I- any of the things that authors need to do what they do. If you are one of the people that provides those services, the AIPP is the place for you. Uh, come join them. Get connected. Uh, you can network with other people. You can find authors that need your help. And if you're an author like me, you will find someone that has a service that you need. This is a great idea. Uh, This is a great place for people to band together and to get their services out there to people who can actually use them. So go to AIPPonline.org and get connected with the people that can help you make better art. Hey writers, uh, if you are anything like me, I know that one of the most frustrating parts about writing and publishing is maintaining all of your marketing. You know, that's where Third Scribe comes in because at Third Scribe, uh, they believe that authors shouldn't have to be webmasters. Not only webmasters, you shouldn't have to be a marketing guru, a graphic designer, or anything else except a writer. Uh, So that's why Rob McClellan and the good guys over at Third Scribe built this awesome platform. Uh, And it's a platform that pretty much handles everything for you. So here's how it works. Third Scribe is the premier social marketing tool for successful authors and cutting-edge publishers. As an author, your job is to create worlds, not get bogged down playing webmaster. And Third Scribe ensures every post happens in the most appealing way possible to attract readers, fans, and everyone else that's curious for maximum effect. Uh, if you want to create something but don't know how, then you should let Third Scribe's concierge support service meet your needs. Uh, not everyone is born a techie, and we, and, and we understand that. In fact, Third Scribe wants to be your personal IT staff, so you can spend your time writing, not dinking with your website. Uh, Third Scribe will support you so that you can do what you do best, and what you do best is write books and share them with the world. So Third Scribe will handle all that for you in an easy, tailored, and effective manner to ensure maximum sales. So go to thirdscribe.com today, uh, sign up, and let them handle all of your website needs for you where you can concentrate on being a writer. Thirdscribe.com. Go visit them today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, Today, I'm very excited to have a guest uh, on. Uh, Scott Meyer is uh, the author of the new book, The Authorities, and also the Magic 2.0 series. Uh, I discovered Scott, like I do a lot of authors, by laying in bed late at night and browsing through my Kindle, going through the Kindle store and looking for new books that uh, that uh, kind of sp- uh, sparked my interest. And I came across 
the first Magic 2.0 book. And I thought, oh, this looks really intriguing. And I downloaded it and I started reading. And uh, like I want to do, uh, Off to Be the Wizard just kind of consumed me for a couple of days. Uh, so I reached out to Scott and said, I'd love to have you on the show. And here he is. So welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks for having me. I, I start each show with a variation of the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, any any relative of mine or anyone who knew me as a kid will, will tell you that basically from an early age, I A, would not shut up, and B, would not stop making things up. About uh, half of the stuff that came out of my mouth was pure fantasy from, from day one. So uh, eventually I grew up and got, you know, uh, gained enough maturity and enough understanding about the world to know that you can't just make things up when you're talking to people. But, uh, yeah, I, I just was always making up stories, making up things. We could, my brothers and I, to their irritation, we could never just play with Legos. There always had to be a story, and, you know, my guy was doing this to your guy, and your guy was trying to get away usually, and, you know, it, it just never stopped. Awesome. Um, did was there any time uh, that you that you said, you know what, I, I don't know that I can actually do this. Maybe it'll be a hobby. Uh, you know, did did you like a lot of folks want to be a storyteller, um, but they don't really see a path where that's like a a, a thing that they can actually do. Did did you uh, flounder at all? Did you you know try to do something else in the meantime? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. First of all, uh, really, I never really viewed writing books for a living to be something that was realistically possible at all. I was not a good student. There were not a lot of books in my house growing up. Uh, in fact, from about the age six on, I don't think there were like any books until I got a library card of my own. And then it was rare to uh, get to the library. Uh, so my initial... Uh, entree into getting people to actually listen to the things I was making up was I wanted to be a stand-up comic. And uh, uh, because you can't do that until the age of 21 when you're in Washington State, I originally went into radio, got fired at that after about four months, went into stand-up comedy because by then I was over 21, did that for a living for about 12 years, and uh, have a lot of great memories, don't regret it, but Every year it became more and more obvious that that way of life was just not for me. I don't like traveling. I'm not an alcoholic. You know, it just, it just wasn't really what I was cut out for. So then, uh, after that sort of imploded, I spent a few years just being an office manager, uh, and then, uh, a Walt Disney World cast member. And during that time, I started a comic strip which uh, I was very proud of. It was an online comic strip called uh, Basic Instructions, which is where a lot of the people who initially read my book first heard about me. And uh, very proud of that. Did that for many years. And uh, eventually that got to a point where I thought, you know, finally I might be able to actually read or write a book and have more than one person know it exists. And that's when I focused on finally writing the novel I had always wanted to write. Tell me about the comic strip. How how did you get started doing that? Well, the comic strip originally started out as uh, something I was going to do just to try to draw people to my website as a comedian. You know, the beauty of a website, especially at that point in time in history from a comedian's point of view, was it was basically a uh, press kit and a copy of your video that everybody already had in their house. They just had to know to go look at it. Uh, the downside is... How do you get people to go look at it? And I thought maybe if I came up with some sort of, you know, regularly updated humorous content for the website, uh, that might draw people in. And uh, one day I was uh, I was at a Burger King, actually, and I was getting a free getting myself a free refill of my soft drink while looking at the sign that said no free refills. And I thought. No, there's definitely a refill, free refill as far as I'm concerned, because this is how the Burger King pays me back for essentially doing their job of filling my beverage. And I thought, you know, I should I should share this idea with people because this is a sort of pearl of brilliance the world needs. Uh, so I came up with this idea for a comic strip where every week it would be a different set of instructions 
for how to do something that you don't really need to have instructions how to do. Gotcha. And and when you um, uh, what did you do with the comic strip? Like as you as you had the idea for it and you started putting it together, how did you decide to to get it out to the world? Well, I did the first one, which was about how to refill your beverage. And it was I was so unhappy with the result that I immediately <laughs> deleted the file. I like put five hours of work into this thing, looked at it and deleted it without telling anybody. But I did a few more and I put them up. Uh, this is this is back in the days of live journal. And I put them up on a live journal and they got I I, I, I connected them to a uh, to a group on live journal that like web comics. And they were they were thank goodness they were supportive and nice about it but it didn't you know set the world on fire or anything and then i i quit stand-up comedy got a day job and uh after a few months started thinking you know i the one thing i really missed about stand-up comedy was having a creative outlet and i thought well i still could do the web comic that would be that would be something i could do in my spare time so i actually got a website you know, created a website, got a domain name, and started putting up the comic uh, on a regular basis, and I just slowly built up a following. And uh, how often did you release those? Uh, at first, it was three times a week. Then eventually, I dropped to two. And then, when I was able to go part time at my day job because the web comic was making as much as a part time job, which was the most the web comic ever made for me, by the way, was about as much as a good part time job. It's not something you go into for the money. But uh, but once I, it got to where it was actually helping pay the bills, I was able to go part-time at Walt Disney World and uh, start doing three comics a week then, and that's what gave me the free time to write a book. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, how did your time at Disney um, affect your creativity? Or did, did could you see that that was uh, – did it, did it spark ideas? I, I would just – uh, imagine an atmosphere like that where you're literally, you know, uh, living in a pretend world and, and working there. Um, and not to mention seeing the the underside of it that other people don't uh, don't see. I, could could you tell that that uh, helped or hindered your creative side? Well, for legal reasons, first I have to say categorically <laughs> that in no way did anything I do at Disney ever uh give me the impetus for any of my books in a very real and legally binding way I, there is no way that the disney corporation can claim any ownership of absolutely any of my yeah yes I, absolutely I, and that, i'm talking i'm talking yeah. in generalities not not ideas oh, yeah. absolutely i know i understand <laughs> <laughs> but you'd be amazed how many people who I worked with at Disney when they found out I was writing a book said you realize Disney owns that book. Oh, like, how how can you possibly think that? Well, you you work for Disney, so anything that you create Disney owns. And uh yeah, that that is not the case. Oh, wow. <laughs> but but many of the cast members believed it. Um as far but, as uh, do, do you oh, think sorry. that that's a uh is that uh, sort of idea encouraged, uh, or is that just kind of one of these rumors that gets started and it, and it grows? It's it's one of those things that has a tiny kernel of something in it because right. you start working for Disney, you do sign a lot of paperwork, and uh, my memory of it is that there is a bit that if you come up with ideas that are, and here's the important part, related to your job specifically. Uh, and you come up with an idea that's related to your job, Disney has ownership of the idea that you come up with for your job. Right. So if I had been working as a writer for Disney, there might be something to that, and I was working on the books on Disney Time, right. but I was I was a, a ride operator and a trainer at a ride. <laughs> so unless I came up with an idea for a theme park ride or a way to get more people through the ride in an hour... There's really, I don't believe, anything to worry about. But, gotcha, um, gotcha. Back to your original yeah, question. I'm sorry um, for that rabbit no, trail. No, no, absolutely. Listen, I could easily talk about Walt Disney World for the next four hours. <laughs> I, I can imagine. I am I am one of those people who got a job there because I believed in the product and uh, still do. But uh, How many years were you there? I was there for eight years. Oh, that's, that's awesome. How old were you when you started? Uh, <laughs> well, that's the... The, the, the part that surprises people, I was in my late 30s when I started there, or okay. my mid-30s at the very least, which is a little, it's 
a lot of people think would be a little bit old to start working at a theme park, but Walt Disney World hires so many people and has so many job positions that, you know, when you're going through your initial orientation process, you're in there with people who are 18 and people who are in their 70s. It's wow. just a weird spread. I, I can and, imagine. And while I was working there, I, I met and got to know a lot of fascinating, great people. And it's just, it's just, it's just a good way to live a lot of life at an accelerated rate in a lot of ways. And uh, that has helped, I believe, helped me create characters. Awesome. So I'm, I'm sorry. Back to the oh, question. Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so, that's fine. Yeah. So w- was this a, uh, a a creative environment for you? It was a creative time for me. Okay. Uh, working at a <laughs> working at a at a, at a theme park ride right, is not a particularly creative job. Uh, I was lucky. I was in a position that had some what we call theming. So I did get to play a character and make things up um, as I went a little bit. But for the most part, what it gives you is a lot of time to think. Because they're, they're, have you been to Walt Disney World or any of the Disney theme parks? I have not. Oh. I, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s and I've never been. Oh, how dare you, sir? I know, how right? I know. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, if, you, no. if you want to disconnect now, we'll, that will be fine. You like what you like. <laughs> It's it's not your fault that you were just somehow born wrong. Exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but now the, the weird thing about the uh, about a major any large theme park ride is that there are various positions, and some of the positions you are essentially a part of the machine, and you just have to keep moving at the pace that the machine uh, gives you. And other positions, you literally will say five words and then stand there silently. For, for the next 30 seconds until your time to say the five words comes up again. So you get a lot of time to observe and a lot of time to think. Gotcha. And and so you were doing the comic strip at the same time as this, or you began uh, them during this, these, these two periods went uh, side by side, right? Yeah, I actually, uh, the day, the reason we moved to Florida is my wife got offered a really good job by Disney. And okay. the day that we that she got offered the job was also the day that I found out that the comic strip would start running in the uh, in the Seattle Weekly. The Seattle Week. It's called Seattle Weekly, but everyone says they assume the at the beginning of it. Um, but anyway, so in 24 hours, I went from being an office manager with a web comic on the side who lived in Seattle to being someone who had just quit his job, had a comic strip running in the local paper. And was planning a move to Florida. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Now, Seattle to, to Disney, Florida has to be culture shock. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I thought I knew what humidity was, but uh, oh. then I found out. Uh, what? So, you know, the, the common stereotype about Seattle is that it rains all the time. Is that true? Well, it's it's not so much that it rains all the time. It's that it. Uh, I mean, Orlando actually gets more rain every year than Florida uh, than uh, than Seattle does. It's just that in Seattle, it's a constant drizzle for about six months out of the year. Uh. It, this is a slight exaggeration, but not by much. When you live in Seattle, you basically get used to the idea that in late October the sun is just going to go away, <laughs> and that it won't come back till sometime around April. And, uh, oh, wow. and it, in the, you get a few spotty, sunny days in between and there will be days where it's, you can't really call it raining, but you can see droplets of water sort of floating in the sky. That's how saturated with, uh, with, uh, that's how ready to rain it is at a moment's notice. Man, I, I live in South Mississippi and, uh, when we have our three weeks of winter, uh, you know, I go stir crazy. <laughs> I, I can't imagine the six months of it. That's crazy. Oh man! So, um, did you did the comic uh, have this point where it it reached a kind of critical mass and and it started growing, uh, you know, outside of your efforts? Uh, there was actually about I want to say two months after we moved to Florida. Uh, one day, my wife and I, and I've told this story before. My wife and I are actually headed in to uh, get our final our permanent disney ids and my phone makes the noise that i've got an email this is back in the day of flip phones and uh i open it up 
and the email is from Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. And uh, he uh, he basically tells me, hey, I like your comic strip, and I write back, if this is one of my idiot comic buddies messing with me, I will, you know, I will, I will hunt you to the ends of the earth. And he found that funny, and we talked back and forth via email for a few weeks, and he ended up pointing out my comic to his readers of his blog. And uh, that is really when I suddenly started getting a lot of attention. Gotcha. Um, when did you start having the idea for this first novel? Well, I had wanted to write a novel for a very long time. In high school, I got the idea that it might be fun to write a novel, but I never thought it was something I'd get to do professionally. And um, then I, I, you know, I, you know how it is when you want to write a novel, but you aren't thinking that you're going to be able to. You, you have ideas and you file them away or you use them for something else. And I had this idea floating around in my head that if uh, and there, there, there's nothing here that's going to be a spoiler, but it is basically the idea of off to be the wizard. And uh, the idea was there's this theory that we live in a computer program. There are people who honestly believe this, and there's some pretty good evidence for it actually. And I always wondered what if you were if that was true, then that would mean that we're all really, when you get down to it, nothing but a series of statistics and figures in some spreadsheet somewhere. And I wondered if you were able to find that spreadsheet, what kind of things could you do with it? And it was something that I would just think about to pass time. But then one day the idea occurred to me that that would also allow time travel and that you could go back in time and pretend to be a wizard and basically live like a king. <laughs> and you've, you're laughing because you've read the book. That I basically have. is <laughs> my, first, my first book, that <laughs> sentence right there. Oh, when when I first got the book, um, I you know, seeing the cover, you've got this uh, uh, this cover that's uh, uh, this the scene of a wizard, uh, but it's it's almost like in eight bit graphics, uh, exactly. you know, kind of pixelated, and and I I looked at it and I said, oh, this is going to be interesting, <laughs> and, and and when I got into the story, you know, your your protagonist is is this uh, kind of uh, uh, armchair hacker, uh, but he doesn't really think he's a bad guy. He's just, you know, kind of having fun on the internet, and and he discovers this thing, uh, and then he starts playing with it, and, and like like you said, when when he discovers that he can alter uh, this text file that he discovers and that he's a uh, he finds where, where he's a part of this uh, some of the fallout from that is hilarious when, uh. when he raises himself off the ground but doesn't think that that gravity will immediately take over and he'll fall right back down to the earth and you know falls on his tailbone a number of times uh, <laughs> that it, it sounded to me uh, sounded you know it, it read to me like you were having a ton of fun when you wrote that I was I was my one of the best decisions, well, first of all, I just want to say that you're not the first person to have been drawn in by that cover. I was very lucky with the uh, quality of the cover art, and I was also very lucky with the uh, with the narrator that they chose to do the audiobooks. A yes. great many of my readers are the, uh, came to me just because they are fans of Luke Daniels, and I cannot say enough how uh, how helpful he has been to me. Well, and I have to pause uh, and interrupt you for just a second. After reading... Uh, maybe the first four or five chapters uh, that night of the book, uh, and eventually having to go to sleep because I had things to do the next day. Um, I had a road trip the next day, so I went to Audible and bought the audio book uh. so that I could finish finish the book on my road trip. So, uh, and yes, uh, the I started the audio book over from the beginning. Uh, because I loved his narration. It was, you know, I listened to the first, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, and I said, oh, forget this crap. I'm going to start over from the beginning. I just, I, yep. I wanted to, and it was amazing. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, he he has been excellent, and Eric Constantino is the name of the man who did the covers for my first three books, and uh, really, I don't have enough good to say about them. They have just been, they have done great work. Yeah. So, I want to get into, into the publishing of those in a few minutes, but yes. uh, first... Uh, the uh, so so you had the idea that you wanted to write this novel, and and you you had this kernel of an idea, the you know life is a simulation, and, and and that whole thing. How did you uh, how did you go from that kernel of an idea to okay, I I have an idea for the book. Like, what was your process for for you know? I, I think a lot of us have great ideas, but they don't. 
uh, they don't hit us in the way that we say, okay, this is a book. Uh, what was it about this idea? Um, it was really, it was the best idea I had at the time for a book. I just realized now I, that I had the best chance I was ever going to have to finally write a novel. And I had this idea that I really liked. It really was the best idea I had. Uh, so the, the process, um, was basically, I had this idea. So then I had an idea for what would happen, but then the first question is, who does it happen to? So I have to come up with my protagonist. And I was about to say before I sidetracked myself, the best decision I made writing that book was when I came up with Martin, my main character. I made him, uh, I made him smart and I made him proactive, but I also made him have almost no foresight. He, <laughs> he never looks before he leaps. He never thinks before he does anything. He gets an idea to try something and he goes directly to trying it. And that's how he ends up falling repeatedly on his tailbone for a chapter and a half. <laughs> uh, uh, then, you know, okay, so how does he discover the file? Figure that out. What happens once he discovers a file? Figure that out. What uh, what would be the result of that? Well, he would get himself into massive trouble, figure out what that looks like. That gives him an excuse to flee to uh, to uh, medieval England. Who does he meet once he gets there? And that gets us into uh, the, the rest of the story. Yeah. Why did you pick medieval, medieval England? Uh, it seemed, A, like it would be a... Uh, it seemed like an obvious place where someone who could do magic... Uh, could make a living doing magic. You know, it's it's it seemed like a place... You think about other times in history and other stereotypical places where there are magic, uh, people doing magic, they're usually being chased out of town with pitchforks. But when you think of medieval England, you think of the wise wizard who lives at the edge of town and helps the hero on their adventure. So it just seemed to me that a guy like Martin, who didn't think things through very carefully, would think, well, this sounds like a great idea. It very much has the the feel of uh, like Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, uh, or this great movie that came out I think late seventies or early eighties. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. Uh, Unidentified Flying Oddball, I think it was. Do you, Do you remember those? Unidentified Flying Oddball was that? Yeah, it's, it's, it was basically a. a uh, I'm I'm getting a Tim kind of a, Conway kind of a vibe. Yeah, off of it. yeah. I'm I, that just came to me right now, and I'm uh, and I wish I wouldn't have said it before I looked it up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm fighting the urge to look it up right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, so. Basically, your thought process was the same process that uh, that Martin uh, used in the book when he was trying to decide where to go. Yes, yes, and also with a similar amount of foresight because. Uh, <laughs> Because really, for me, writing all the novels I've written is a matter of me getting an idea, starting to execute the idea, and then I don't know how it is for you. But for me, it's then fixing my mistakes as I go. And really, when you read one of my novels, you're reading a long series of mistake fixes more than <laughs> more than anything else. Uh, speaking of which... Um... What was your your writing process? I'm assuming that this was not something that was uh, that was plotted out in the beginning. Oh, it was. It was uh, the 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 process I'm telling you about was really primarily writing the outline. But uh, I I learned from uh, doing the comic strip. I need a plan. I'm not someone. I actually tried to write two novels before uh, going by the seat of my pants and wrote myself into a corner almost immediately on both of them and ended up quitting in disgust and shame. Wow. Um, so so when you had the idea for this, you, you started sketching it out and said, okay, I'm going to uh, kind of get an arc uh, to write through. Uh, did you envision that this was more than one book from the beginning? I, I knew that I wanted to end it in such a way that it could continue, but I really, I did not see... When I was writing off to be the wizard, I did not see it as a realistic possibility that I would any time in the near future be working on a second book. I thought it was going to be put this book out, self-publish it, go back to the comic and working at Disney, and then, you know, see how this does. It was it was not, you know, this this is the beginning of something big for me, you know. It was just something I had always wanted to do, and this was my chance to do it. 
D- did you uh, leave room at the end for Martin to continue if he uh, – oh. uh, was, was that a, a conscious effort? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I knew – I. I don't want to ruin anything for those of your listeners who haven't read the book already, but I knew I didn't want it to be the kind of book that ends with all of the characters dying horribly. (laughs) So as long as your protagonist survives and seeing as he's pictured on the cover of all three books, I don't think I'm ruining anything (laughs) by saying that my protagonist survives. There's always a chance to come back and do something else. Gotcha. Uh, So how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, The first draft took about three and a half months. Uh, When I'm writing a first draft, I basically, every day, I sit down, first thing, you know, after my shower and my exercise and everything, and it's an hour and a half or a thousand words. Uh, Sometimes, if things aren't going well, it's whichever comes first. On a good day, it's whichever comes second, but it's an hour and a half or a thousand words every day. And if you can keep up that pace seven days a week, you usually end up after about three to three and a half months with a first draft. Gotcha. Um, do you have that same kind of? Uh, uh, do you set set aside that same kind of time to work on the web comic? Well, I don't do the web comic anymore. Uh, okay. I, I stopped the web comic over a year ago now. Okay. Almost just actually about nine months ago, and uh, at the time uh, it would be. Uh, <laughs> At the time that I was writing off to be the wizard, it was work part time at Disney, write in the morning, and then do the web com- comic at night. And then when I was able to quit Disney, it became mornings were for novels, afternoons were for the web comic. Now it's mornings are for the novel I'm working on, afternoons are for either editing the previous novel or working on the next novel. Gotcha. What what was it like uh, during the time where you were writing the webcomic and the novel uh, where you've got two completely different uh, creative exercises that you're uh, balancing, one of the left hand, one of the right hand, so to speak? Uh, was that ever a, uh, a chore to keep those things separated and, and to keep uh, the momentum on both? Keeping them separated was not a problem because they're very different things. Um, Sorry, excuse me. Um, As far as the momentum goes, by the time the novel started, I had been doing the webcomic for seven years or something like that. And uh, I had had that process pretty well. I don't want to say dialed in because that's not really what I mean. But I I knew what I was doing there. When I would sit down to work on the webcomic, I knew what my process was. And as time went on, it certainly didn't get easier, but it wasn't getting harder because I was working on the novel. Uh, okay. Um, so you finish this first novel, and you've got a completed manuscript. Uh, what do you decide to do with it? Well, the plan was always self-publishing. I, okay. I, I, uh, you t- tell me why. What, what, what informed that decision? Well, I, I I knew some people who had uh, who had attempted to uh, get novels published the uh, the traditional way, and I actually uh, one of the two novels that I tried before that I wrote myself into a corner on, I did go back, start over, finish it, and send it away to a couple of uh, publishers with uh, the predictable amount of success. Um, and in in retrospect, they were right to have turned it down. It was not of the quality level it needed to be, but. Um, I just basically I knew that if I sent the uh, the novel in the traditional route, I knew that that would be time pro- that that would take a great deal of time, and I knew that at that point in history, and it is still true today, but this was just when it was to be true that when you're making a novel, actually getting it for sale in front of people is now, if you're willing to go the self-publishing route, the easiest part. You know, now you can just go to Amazon, you can go to KDP, you can go to uh, to the various tools that Amazon and uh, Apple and Google have in, a, in place, and you can get your novel out in front of people and available in the world's largest bookstore. That, which used to be the impossible part, is now the easy part. The hard part, aside from writing the book, which is hard and is supposed to be hard, the days when it's easier, the days that I think I'm doing something wrong, 
Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, nothing's more nerve wracking than thinking, "Wow, that idea came really easily." <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but the the hard part these days is getting people to actually know that your book exists and go check it out. And I looked at the situation and I said, I've got this following of my webcomic. I've got, you know, depending on the day, five to 15,000 people that I can, I can advertise this to just by sending out an email saying, Hey, this thing exists. And it seemed logically to me that if I priced it at a small enough price point, something to where, you know, a, a large Starbucks is more expensive a lot of them would probably give it a try just to support my webcomic. Right. So that was my plan. And 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 so what happened? Uh you you, you put it out, you send this out to your to your audience and then uh, and then you you sit in front of the keyboard and you wait. Uh I sent it out. <laughs> yeah, but sadly that's 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 what we all do. You've just, just described my higher life actually. Right. <laughs> the last decade of my life summed up in one sentence. Um no, I uh, I put it out there, and uh, I watched, you know, like like a politician waiting for the return. I watched to see, A, if anybody bought it, and B, if anybody liked it. And in about less than a month after I put it out, uh, I got contacted by my publisher, and they wanted to know if anyone had uh, purchased the publishing rights yet. And I said no, and we, we started talking. And who is that publisher? 47 North. Which is a fully owned subsidiary of Amazon, so, right? So I, uh, I've always, I've never asked. I've always wondered if they found out through word of mouth or because some algorithm told them that it was uh, selling and getting good reviews. But well, I don't was, know. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. What uh, I, I'm assuming the the book started doing well uh, and and had. A, a fairly strong launch is is that a safe assumption it it did well because like i said i i i believe my starting price on it was like 299 or 399 yeah. and i just basically told my uh told my readers you know hey i don't i don't like to ask you for money unless i'm offering you something in return here's an opportunity where i'm offering you something in return i'm very proud of it please check it out and i did manage to sell a few thousand copies within the course of the first week out, which for for a self published book is good enough that I assume it got their attention. That there can't be enough said uh, for uh, for having a core group of people uh, that believe in you and believe in your work uh, as that catalyst to to help uh, kind of put things into orbit. That's uh, I, I I can only imagine having that list of people. And that dedicated readership uh, was a was a huge help in getting the the book off the ground, and and you you have to assume yeah. uh, that that goes into uh, Forty Seven North's decision to contact you. That's uh, if there's a takeaway that people uh, you know could uh, could get their hands on, it would be uh, I would think definitely get uh, amass your your group of supporters uh, yeah. that can help you. I will never stop being grateful to my readers because they have made my current uh, situation possible. And I would not have my readers if I hadn't put my webcomic, put a lot of work into my webcomic, and then put it out online for free for many, many years. That is that is how I built it up, by slowly learning to do what I do and putting it out online for free. It's, now that uh, – I'm glad you said that because um, – uh, that that's one of the reasons that uh, that I do this podcast is uh, I I give it away for free on the internet like you know like so many other creative endeavors, uh, but you know we we've slowly built a a really large listenership mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know when when it's time to uh, to launch something to put a new uh, you know piece of of writing or whatever into the world. Uh, you you have kind of earned a, a little bit of rapport with people uh, because you've you've done this thing for them for so long. Uh, is it, there there can't be enough said for uh, you know building goodwill with people and and the things that you do. Uh, do you have any any recommendations for people that maybe not everyone's a, a cartoonist you know or, or uh, uh, you know what what are some things that you could think of that would would help people to do that? Well, I. I... I basically would say whatever it is that you do, do it as often as possible and put it, make it available online. And I know that that sounds 
crazy and simplistic, but I mean, I'm where I am because I did that. The, one of my favorite musicians is a man named Jonathan Colton, who I don't know if you're aware of him, but he yeah. first came to people's attention because he started a website called Thing a Week, where he just would write, produce, and record a new song every week. And he did that for, for I, I want to say, two years, and it got attention because the songs were really good. I mean, there are no guarantees if what, yeah. I mean, what you're doing might never get anybody's attention. That, and that doesn't even necessarily mean that what you're doing isn't good. It's just for whatever reason not catching on. But you, I guess in a certain sense, I've never put it this way before, but it's almost like a lottery ticket. It's like everything that you put out online for free is like buying a lottery ticket. And the more of those that you have, that you have put out into the universe, the more chances there are of something catching somebody's attention. Yeah. And, and, and we live in a time now where you can do just about anything. And uh, if, if you're creative at all, th- there's an outlet uh, that, that someone will appreciate it. And then it's up to you to, to take that. Uh, that following, I hate that term, yeah. but that, you know, that group of people that, that, that dig what you do, uh, it's up to you then to, you know, uh, to utilize that and to, uh, you know, to do something with it. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think it's fantastic. I, I love your story of how that got launched. Um, so when 47 North picked up the book, uh, did you have that existing cover? from the beginning or uh was that part of the 47 north uh, acquisition that was part of 47 north and just to uh just to clarify one point from the previous question uh and i i'm with you that i don't like the word following it makes me sound like i have massive massive statues of myself and big paintings of me helping yeah, the workers it's... reeve wheat or something yeah it, it sounds a little douchey exactly but yeah but uh but on the one hand there's there's uh there's uh making use of those people who are following you. You don't want to abuse them though. You don't want to, you don't want to, I have known, I have seen some people online who you get the impression they're attempting to harvest every dime and, and make use of every opportunity for free PR that they're trying to get. And, uh, I would, I would advise people to avoid that. That's just my two cents. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but the 47 North, as you were saying, the, the, yeah. just to get back to that, because that's also good. I actually, the original self-published version, I made the cover myself. And it was, um, it was uh, when you compare it to the 47 North version, you can only call my cover inferior in every way. <laughs> uh, but you're an artist. Well. It had, it had to be amazing. Don't say that until you've seen my comics. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I've read your comic strip. <laughs> but, uh, I love your comic strip. Oh, it's amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I discovered your comic strip after you stopped writing it, of oh. course. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I love going through the archives. And uh, my son has a twisted sense of humor like I do. And we, we just laugh and laugh. So it's great. You'll be happy to uh, know my favorite two characters I ever created for the comic strip have not started running in the reruns yet. So you've still got Omnipresent Man and the Knife Kateer to look forward to. <laughs> I'm uh, writing those down on my notebook right now, uh, and I'll post links to those two in the uh, in the show notes. Ah. Um, so, so 47 North, uh, they contact you. Uh, has anyone offered to to buy the book yet? And um, first off, when you got that uh, uh, when when you got that email or communication, however it came, um, were you were you kind of taken aback? Oh, I was shocked. I was shocked. The first email I got actually was from a uh, from a uh, literary agent from a very large, uh, well known firm, who uh, said, "I've I've read the first three chapters of Off to Be the Wizard. Are you interested in uh, in uh, any representation?" And I wrote back, you know, while you know sitting in my car in the parking lot in my Disney costume, yes, I am interested in representation. <laughs> And he I said, I'll get back to you uh, when I finish the book. And then I heard nothing. Oh, <laughs> he has never returned an email from me since. So The I've, dreaded crickets. Exactly. So I've always wanted to, to just meet him someday and ask, okay, was it that you finished the book and didn't like it? Or was I caught in a spam filter? But, uh, but then 47 North contacted me. So I was excited. But I was also a little leery because this something like this had already turned into nothing. But... Uh, 
but the oh. the the person who contacted me from Forty Seven North had finished the book, which I took as a good sign. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they they ended up offering me a three book deal, so I went from a cartoonist who wrote a book for fun to having a three book deal that was, you know, more lucrative certainly than working at Mission Space at Walt Disney World. So I uh, <laughs> so I yeah. took it with both hands. Well, I had. Um... Uh, I interviewed someone uh, a while back who was self-published and got picked up by forty, uh, yeah, forty-seven North, and uh, and and somewhere online in the in the deep dark crevices of where people post comments, uh, someone said that that he didn't have self-publishing cred uh, because he was picked up by forty-seven North, uh, but a lot of people don't realize that um, I I don't know of anyone and. Uh, I'm sure someone will correct me, but I don't know of anyone that has been giving a given a publishing deal with 47 North uh, before they actually wrote a book. Uh, everyone I've ever talked to had a book self-published and then was picked up uh, because 47 North saw that that this that this was in some way uh, a uh, a popular book or you know had found an audience or was resonating and they thought they could take this book to an even higher level. That that has certainly been my experience. I uh, that, I have not spoken to anyone whose story wasn't what you just said. Yeah, and 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 that there's anything uh, you know uh, self publishing cred needs to be a thing that's that's ludicrous. But you know we we all need to take whatever path is is the right for us, whether it's self publishing or traditional publishing. Uh, I think we can argue pros and cons all day long about both, but it all comes down to what's best for the author and what's best for that book. Agreed. And it seems like the word cred is almost always only used by people who are taking it away. You know, yeah. you don't have cred and, and, you know, what is cred except for this thing that you're telling me I don't have. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, th there's trolls everywhere. Oh. Just ignore the trolls and, and, and do your thing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so they offered you a three book deal. Uh, and did you, well, first off, before you started working on the second book, uh, did they have uh, 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 comments about the first book? Did they want you to change anything? Uh, obviously, they changed your cover art. Yeah. Uh, but kind of what was the process of, of, uh, of going forward with this existing book? Well, uh, to say to say they wanted to change things is. A accurate, but B not fair, not the best way to put it. What it is is they wanted to have it professionally edited, which my book gotcha. had not been. So the first change was all the spelling and grammar errors. They they insisted on changing those for some reason. And I know, I know, they don't understand my art. Um, Overlords of the Amazon. Right, I deliberately overused commas. Don't you understand that, people? Uh, yeah, they uh, they they got it professionally uh, copy uh, copy edited, and they they did a developmental edit, which okay. I found helpful. I I know a lot of people don't seem to enjoy being developmental edited. That's I don't think the first thing a developmental editor would tell me is that that's not how you say that. But um, <laughs> but I I see it as an opportunity to to improve my writing, which is yeah. I'm as as far as actually being a writer goes, I have high school composition. And that's my entire entire education, aside from reading uh, elements of style. So yeah. any help I can get, I am open to. Well, people don't like developmental edits because uh, it you have to put your ego aside. Yeah, it it, it really is. Uh, it, it's a little shocking. It is. You know, it is. The first time. <laughs> oh, it's shocking every time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it never stops being shocking. I, I've told more than one person this, but it's I, I'm ashamed to say it's absolutely true. Whenever I get notes from from any professional uh, person who's giving me notes on the book, no matter who they are, my first impulse is to say, how dare you? <laughs> then, then the second impulse is, well, where's your book? Let's see your book. Then the third yeah. impulse is, OK, shut up and think about this for an hour or two. <laughs> And usually, after the hour or two are up, I not only see that they have a point, I usually end up agreeing with them. So, yeah. you just have to get past the ego. And it's hard, because sure. you don't sit down to write a novel unless you have an ego. You know, That's right. Someone without an ego does not think, I'm going to write 10, uh, 100,000 words of something, and everyone will want to read it. Right. Yeah, there, there's a... 
there's a touch of narcissism that goes along with it. And as much as we try to push that down, it, it's kind of the nature of the beast a little bit. So um, did, when uh, when 47 North acquired the book and then wanted to go through these developmental editing and, and line editing, uh, did the book uh, come off of Amazon during that time or was it still available? No, and I, I still I – am, I am grateful but confused – by the way 47 North does business, they have been nothing but great to me in every regard. And one of the ways they did that was by, uh, by, uh, and I don't think I'm not able legally to talk about, you know, the details of any of my contracts, but sure. at the time, one of the things that, uh, that, that shocked me was that they allowed me to keep my self published version of the book up on Amazon until the like the week before their edition was published. Wow. Yeah. I, I think That's... I think the thinking might have been at the time that every copy of that that sold would be an advertisement for the professionally edited and produced version they were going to do. But yeah. but yeah, it, it stayed on. Yeah. Did when when their version went live, did your previous reviews uh, and stuff roll over to that one? My memory is that they did. My memory is that they did. Yeah, I, I would think so. With them being, you know, an Amazon imprint, uh, but man, have I heard some horror stories uh, of people that that self published. That uh, Nick Cole, for one, comes to mind uh, with his uh, Old Man in the Wasteland, mm. uh, that had just had a huge audience, and then he sold it to Harper Collins. They pulled it off. Uh, of Amazon and all of his reviews just went away mm. and and he had to start over from scratch oh. that uh, yeah that, that that's suck. a nightmare yeah oh. that the the thing that got you to that place in the beginning is gone yep. uh and oh man what a nightmare and of course you I, picture I'm, the first person leaving a new review being someone who doesn't like it that's exactly. that's exactly what you picture happening. Yeah, uh, so I'm so happy that worked out better for you. Um, so, how did you follow that up with the second book? What was your uh, what was your plan and process? Well, I had I had uh, I had you know at the end of the first book I had a certain situation, and uh, without getting into too many details, I had certain characters that I knew that I really liked writing for. And I knew that one of my uh, one of my protagonists, one of my characters, had gone to another location. So the the obvious thing was to allow my other characters to go to that location as well. That gave me a new place to explore, and uh, gave me a new situation to uh, to delve into. In this case, it was Atlantis, which is I, I made up a completely different version of Atlantis than I think had ever been done before. And that's not bragging that in fact could be a knock against my work, but it was at least a new take on the idea of Atlantis. So, so that gave me a lot to explore. And again, it was just a matter of, okay, why do they go there? Okay. What happens once they get there and how do they react? Uh, That's a great point that you bring up about Atlantis. Uh, because in the first book, uh, you travel to uh, – Martin, our protagonist, travels to medieval England. Uh, but this does not read like a historical fiction uh, novel. This is not like uh, Outlander, yeah. uh, for instance, you know, that, that goes back to 17th century uh, Scotland, and it's very uh, true. Uh, did you uh, purposefully keep this uh, out of the realm of uh, – historicism and and uh, uh you know, did yes. you did you plan on just keeping it lighthearted and you know where where people wouldn't be like oh this is not this is not real this threw me out of the story uh it seems to me that would be very careful crafting to keep that from happening it, it, it was and it is and uh yeah i i deliberately wanted to keep it fun and light and i didn't want to get bogged down in the details that said there are some books that are great that are all about the details uh, but in this case, I just wanted it to be about the about the story and about the dialogue and about the fun. And the beauty of it being a time travel story is that I was able to immediately say, well, there's what I call chronological pollution. There's people have gone back even further and messed things up. So it, it gives me a lot of leeway to to really mess with history. I mean, I have I have glass windows like 200 years before they're actually invented. And uh, I forget why I decided to have glass windows other than that's just what I wrote and I was able to explain it away. <laughs> but, 
but uh, yeah, it's just the the by virtue of the fact that it was a time travel story, I was able to sidestep a lot of that. I love it. Love it, uh, and, and we won't get into uh, books two and three uh, so much because there's uh, you really need to read the first book, and uh, I encourage everyone to go pick up uh, the first book, uh, Off to Be the Wizard. Uh, it's available on Amazon, uh, as is everything. Uh, but you recently published a new book called The Authorities, and it's got a really intriguing cover. It it kind of gives me this, uh, I don't know, kind of a uh, a dragnet vibe or something like that. Uh, what? What is this book about? Uh, first, about that cover, that is another cover that I think is excellent. And that cover was actually designed by my wife, who is a graphic designer. So, uh, uh, And she is... Well, she did an amazing she job. She is within earshot of me, and she just blushed a little bit when I said that. <laughs> but she is an excellent graphic designer, and she uh, designed that cover for me, and I'm nothing but happy with it. And yes, it does remind me a bit of Dragnet. Um, the, uh, the Authorities is... You always, you always hear... a. A lot of times when you, it's, it's a, it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stammering and talking all over myself. This is why I'm not in marketing. Um, <laughs> the authorities is a modern day crime, uh, novel. Originally it was going to have a, uh, a sort of a sci-fi overlay, but that didn't end up happening. It's more just a straight comedy with a little bit of stuff about technology in there. And, uh, my initial thought, uh, my my jumping off point for the authorities was you always you know, the the stereotype is that you have the wild rebel cop and then the straight laced person who is forced to try to keep up with them. You know you had that on uh, you know Riggs and Murtaugh where uh, on uh, Lethal Weapon where Danny Glover was always getting too old for this shit. Yeah, you, you have it on. There was a show called The Good Guys. That was basically that Colin Hanks played the uh, the neb being drug along by this uh, wild man of a police officer. And I thought, what would happen if instead you basically took Niles from the show Frasier and forced him to pretend to be Dirty Harry? And uh, that's basically the book I tried to write was Niles Crane as, Dar- as Dirty Harry. I love it. Um, there seems to be a, a resurgence of some of this kind of crime noir uh, with a light-hearted feel to it, uh, I, uh, I I love that. That's uh, kind of seeing a uh, finding an audience again. That's uh, that's great. So, did 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 you have the idea for this uh, as you finished uh, book three of uh, of Off to Be the Wizard? I did. I did the three Off to Be the Wizard books. Then the next book I did was a book called Master of Formalities, which I am very proud of. It hasn't gotten the attention that uh, the authorities or uh, off to be the wizard has, but I'm very proud of it. Its idea was Downton Abbey, but set in the Dune universe. And then, uh, oh, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, well, well, read it and let me know what you think. But I, <laughs> I am very proud of it. Um, then, uh, then I wrote, uh, while I was writing that, I got the idea for the orders. Awesome. Um, and did you, did you find that publishing these books outside of, uh, of that original trilogy did, did your uh, existing audience? Uh, I, I know they're, they're different genres. Uh, was that difficult uh, jumping to a new genre? Uh, it would, yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, the other two books have done well. I'm very proud of not only how they came out, but how they've done. But they have not yeah. done as well as Off to Be the Wizard because you know that's where people first learned about me. And that's right. that's what people seem to be enjoying. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just a matter now of trying to keep the quality up on any book that I write. Yeah. Uh, Scott, this has been a fantastic hour uh, that we've spent together. Where can people find your work? Uh, my uh, my my uh, books are all available on Amazon. There's the uh, Magic 2.0 series, which is off to be the wizard. A uh, spell or high water and an unwelcome quest. And I should point out that about the time this uh, podcast is coming out, both spell or high water and an unwelcome quest will be available as part of uh, the Kindle monthly deal for an nine nine cents a piece. Uh, you can also find both uh, Master of Formalities and the Authorities on Amazon. And uh, my uh, comic strip is, as you said earlier, in now permanent reruns, but I'm rerunning all of the comics in the order that they originally aired. And those are at uh, basic instructions. Love it. Love it. And uh, all of your books are available in Kindle Unlimited, aren't they? Yes, they they are. And on Audible, Uh, by the way, all of them. 
Excellent, excellent. I can I can definitely vouch uh, for the first two books in Magic 2.0. I'm still working. Uh, I'm about to start on the third book, uh, and I'm going to go add Master Formalities uh, right after this and uh, and the Authorities next. So uh, I'm a super fan. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> 